Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Chest Critical Advancements webinar sponsored by TheraVance Biopharma. We're gonna be talking today about considering the impact of an all nebulizer management strategy in the hospital setting and evidence-based review. We are so fortunate today to have two leading experts in the field who are with us, who will walk us through this uh, presentation. We have Trent Larson, who is an advanced practice pharmacist out of Banner Health System in Phoenix, Arizona. We also have Lexi Carraway, who is our cardiopulmonary manager out of Clay County Hospital in Flora, Illinois. So before we get started, I just wanted to briefly run through some disclosures. So this presentation has been developed and funded by TheraVance Biopharma, and our speakers potentially may have been com compensated by TheraVance Biopharma to serve as speakers for this program. So this presentation is intended to be informative and educational in nature. Presenters, authors, uh, funders of this session, including TheraVance Biopharma, are not suggesting, recommending, or making any representations regarding the safety or efficacy of any drugs, devices, medical procedures, treatments, or any in any context. Nothing in this presentation should be interpreted as a suggestion or a recommendation regarding the exercise of yours or any other healthcare provider's professional judgment regarding the treatment of any patient. And any personal information that was collected on the participants of this webinar will be handled in accordance with their advanced biopharma's privacy policy, which can be found at the link below. So just some acknowledgements, you know, this is not a one size fits all strategy. The literature that is presented around this strategy may not be the best fit for every organization. And while the literature that we review today is supportive of this approach, there is no current published uh, information that was found in contradiction. Just some learning objectives. So first we're gonna outline the impact of an all nebulization management approach for the administration of respiratory medications in the hospital setting and also to walk through the published literature. We'll talk about respiratory care productivity, value-based care and protocols, we will address multidisciplinary workload considerations for hospitals who are considering or who are thinking about a switch to an all nebulization strategy. And lastly, we'll talk about the impact of an all neb strategy on current treatment paradigms. So with that, I'll pass it over to Trent Larson to talk about aerosol therapy considerations, what has been published. Trent? Well, thank you, Lauren. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Just a little more background on myself uh, and the reason why I, I agreed to do this. Um, I've been with Banner Health for uh, about 31 years now. So I was one of the primary uh, clinical pharmacists in charge of trying to roll out our um, nebulized process. So I think I'll, I'll try to give you my experience and um, as we roll through these slides. But I think this first, you know, this study that's published in 2015 by Sacken et al., it really was not a study that was looking at all them. I mean, what they were really trying to approach was, you know, we're all buying inhalers from all the same manufacturers in the United States and even outside the United States, um, the vast majority of which are not institutional size. I would argue back in 2015, um, there were definitely less institutional size than we have today, but we still have, you know, way too many inhalers that I think have, you know, 60 to 200 count in inhalation doses in those that are probably more geared for outpatient versus an inpatient to keep care of stay. What they did is they they looked at their 690 bed hospital in in Tennessee. They um, really tried to focus on just their COPD patients and asthma, and they found their 478 patients at that criteria. And really, what they did is you can see the the inhalers on the right, you know, with Benalin, Atrovent, Spiriva, Floridol, Slovan, Simbacord, the same inhalers that we still have today, um, plus many more. And you can see how many doses you know they use versus what was dispensed, and it, it really does illustrate. And 87% wastage, you know, by the time the patient's discharged out of the hospital, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, when you quantify those doses, they came out to about $86,000, almost 87. Um, and they really left that, you know, that I think health systems and hospitals that, that do face this challenge and see these inhalers getting lost and coming back to the pharmacy to be thrown in the trash and incinerated. And we do have to pay money depending on the inhaler, depending on, um, rules and regs on hazardous material waste, 
um, you know, there should be more practical strategies for that. Um, you know, around that time, just as an example, you know, I wish I had a slide on here for you just um, as a side note, you know, I had that same issue. Um, I was at a very large hospital, um, over 600 beds. I would say we're um, one of the largest community hospitals, um, a lot of COPD patients, and just use truckloads of inhalers. Um, and what I did, and, you know, I would I would argue if any of you have have students or residents or even yourself want a little project, if you're looking at this as a possible cost savings, um, I asked um, for my own bucket in the pharmacy. I asked for them to, for about two weeks to go back and just every single inhaler that comes back in that pharmacy that's supposed to be trash, knowing that some of these are going home with people and aren't going to show up, I want them all. And then um, I spent my evenings digging through every one of them, logging how much we dispensed, how much we threw away and what got used. And I came up with literally the identical number of about 88% wastage. And I think that was uh, probably my first green light that I need to look into that as an option. So this this study is actually mine. So, you know, I think we, we definitely have more publications now, um, this many years later than what, than what I had at my disposal. Um, you know, all nub is really not that new of a concept. It's interesting um, for those of you in the pharmacy world that may have gone to American Society Hospital Pharmacy. Um, I don't know what was there this year on these posters, but, you know, back in 2015, um, my boss had gone there and come back and handed me about seven different protocols from hospitals around the country at that time, even that were showing their all net process. Um, most of them never had published anything. So, you know, if you look at the protocols, you know, you can sort of get an idea that we've only got so many nebulized products out there versus inhalers. So I think the protocols mimic each other pretty similar. So it was pretty easy to go back and I think come up with our own protocol. Um, but the reason why I published this was because I felt like there just wasn't anything out there. So what we did, you know, in our system, we're very top down. We have a system PNT. I think we try to have a standardized one fits all approach. Um, you know, this, that juncture, we had 28 hospitals, six states. We now have 31, um, with expansion, but, um, you know, really we did a big phase rollout. Um, we tried to let, different facilities go at different junctures throughout 2016. So at this point, you know, we're probably in year eight of this. Um, you know, the second bullet point really was more of a concept of the fact that, you know, we all face drug inflation. Um, it still exists. Um, that was based out of uh, American Hospital, um, you know, survey came out of Chicago. And it just showed that, you know, we all face it, I think, even more so now than we probably do back then. Um, but really what I found was, you know, if I looked at our pre-spend, uh, we were spending over $4 million a year on inhalers and nebs. Uh, we didn't have any restrictions on them either. Sort of a free-for-all. We did have a GSK contract, and that was, you know, sort of having flow vent and adverse standardized. So we did have our own therapeutic interchange for that segment. Um, but really what happened was if you go back, you know, I wanted two years. I'm a big fan of, you know, just one year does not a trend make. So I really wanted to look at two years. And we dropped the the overall spend down to about 2.5 million both years, um, 2.4, 2.5, and and I think that really illustrated how much we were able to you know pull those costs down when it comes to respiratory drugs. Um, and just as a side note, this past weekend, just because I hadn't done the exercise in a while, I did go back through and looked at our entire system. And if you think about it, you know that that 1.56, 1.64, those were like 27 to 2018, 2018 to 2019 numbers. Uh, we're in 2023 now, and even with the inflation of drugs, um, we are parked at about 2.5 million. We've literally had no increase in spend, and we've actually got two extra hospitals on board. I don't have that stratified to patient counts, but I think that illustrates that you can do this, and it does help maintain the cost and keep it down. Um, one of the big things that I think that, you know, when you're talking to providers or stakeholders that want to, um, you know, when you're considering something like this, I think there's a natural tendency to, to, to think, you know, well, if we get rid of inhalers, I think our readmission rates are just going to go in the, the toilet. Um, and I, and I think this helps illustrate that that is not the case. Um, we all know if you look at COPD readmission rates, all cause versus respiratory, it's it's a very complicated issue. It's multifactorial. It's not just about inhalers or nebs. You're not going to solve this problem with either. 
if you don't have navigators, if you don't have good discharge um, transitions of care protocols, you are never going to consistently impact the ability to give people the resources and the meds they need, depending on their own clinical situation. Um, you know, just as an example here, you know, this was at the campus I was at because I was on a COPD reduc reduction team when we had inhalers, and we never could actually move the needle. I mean, we were parked at 21%. We were second worst in the system. Nothing we did worked. You know, after that, we basically, um, you know, started this whole concept of going to an all med protocol and we did get that implemented. And, you know, I really looked at when I published this, I did have a sort of post year three, but what we did do is we started developing, um, RTs that were more COPD specific, doing PFERS, peak inflammatory flow rates, looking to see if patients were actually able to pull enough to even be using a lot of the dry powder inhalers that we're using, making recommendations to physicians, pulling in the case managers, doing more education, getting, um, you know, the outside facilities, you know, the DME companies that actually know how to manage these patients from a Medicare Part B when you're talking about if there's someone that's not a good candidate for inhalers and you can use NEVs. Um, they can get them on the resources they need. And I think with that effort, we started to pull things down and we were able to maintain it. And I think that shows you that you can get rid of, you know, inhalers. As long as you do the other things, you can start making a dent. Um, another study that, that recently um, came out um, was the uh, Lacrone paper. Um, you know, they're based out of uh, the St. Alphonse system in, in Idaho. And um, they they actually... Um, looked at their SABA sum, a lot of ICS conversions. Um, they're a 387 bed regal medical center. Their primary outcomes were really just to look at, they had to do a manual interchange. Um, and I think that's something we'll get to later about manual versus automatic interchanges in the EHR. But they, they just looked specifically at 98 patients. So I think I would like to focus on the fact that, you know, their savings up top in that title of about 14,000 was for 98 patients. It wasn't a total number for their entire hospital including other patients, but they wanted to look at, you know, what percentage of patients were converted. They found that 94% were with a manual interchange. I think those of us that do interchanges at order entry verification with pharmacy know that our staff can get busy at times. It may not be 100%. I think that shows there was a high degree of interchanges, whereas if you did a, let's say we implement an informatically um, written automatic interchange, you'd probably achieve 100%, but I think that shows it was good. Um, you know, they saved 13,808. Um, they looked at discrepancies at discharge. Um, they found that, um, they had about a 14.3%. Some of that was therapeutic duplications. Um, they didn't really, the, the, I think the downfall of this study is they did not really benchmark that against what their therapeutic duplication occurrence rate was when they were on inhalers. Um, I would argue that if you took a lot of us, we can't carry every inhaler. So a lot of us probably, you know, before we did this, had a contract. Like I mentioned, we had a GSK. I was well aware of many times that, you know, someone came in on Dulera or Simbacor for throwing them on Advair. They're going out. Our, dis our discharge med rec is not super robust always. And then you find stories that they're going home on both Dulera and Simbacor. So I don't think... Um, it's probably fairly similar, although we can't make that that leap based on this trial. They didn't bench it. Um, the other thing is they tried to look at discharge readmissions. They did not find any issues um, with the all-net process impacting readmission rates, but they also, they just made that statement. They didn't actually compare it to, um, say, people with readmissions that are just on, on the inhalers. But that's where I think my, my efforts on my um, paper, I tried to show that a little bit more. I'm going to turn this section over to Lexi since it will touch on some of the RT information. Thanks, Trent. This paper by Gonzalez's group adds on to Trent Larson's study, and the purpose of this study was to examine the financial impact of an automatic formulary substitution of nebulized solutions for inhalers and measure the impact of respiratory workload. The previous study we covered showed the economic impact of these therapeutic interchanges, but didn't quantify RT workload. This was a retrospective observational study conducted in a 326-bed non-academic community hospital. Adult patients who received respiratory medications during an admission from December 16 to February 17 were the control group and patients admitted from December 17 to 18 after the therapeutic interchange for the study group. 
The primary outcomes were the cost of respiratory medications per hospital stay and the number of RCP visits per hospital stay. The secondary outcome was the cost of wasted doses per hospital stay. 3,766 patients were included in the study with 2,030 patients in the control group. The mean cost of respiratory medications per hospital stay was significantly lower in the study group versus the control group. The mean cost of wasted doses was significantly lower in the study group versus the control group. In conclusion, the automatic formulary su substitution of nebulization solutions for inhaler medications significantly decreased medication costs without increasing the average number of RCP visits per hospital stay while drastically reducing wasted medications. This is a study of my own, and this is a study in a 120-bed um, community hospital in central Illinois. Little background on this project is we our process for um, delivering medications was the respiratory therapist split the um, split it with the nurses uh, on sending the patients home. RTs delivered both the MDIs and the nebulizers. Um, so basically, we realized we were losing some of our steroids to um, being sent home with patients. We annualized an estimated loss of fifty thousand uh, dollars. So, what's unique about our study is that we implemented this in the middle of COVID. It was in October of twenty twenty. By using PPE, um, nebulized filters, and negative pressure rooms, we were able to safely do this for staff. At admission, the pharmacists would auto-substitute the F HFAs for nebulizers unless specific instructions were received from doctors, which we had a few physicians who preferred that they stayed on their home um, inhaler, and we also didn't do this for behavioral health patients. After annualizing the study results, we discovered that we saved about $31,000 annually for pharmacy, and we were able to save $12,000 annually for, from our respiratory department because we were no longer purchasing nearly as many spacers. Our pharmacy techs also saved a lot of time, and there was a lot of benefit and staff satisfaction because they were no longer cleaning all the, all the medications. Um, in conclusion, transitioning to nebulized medication showed substantial savings for our health system. It improved patient safety by eliminating cross-contamination from reprocessed inhalers. It saved our pharmacy techs reprocessing time, and it saved money on spacers. So the key takeaways here are that the data reviewed indicates that handheld inhaler use is associated with large amounts of wasted doses, as most patients' average length of stay is shorter than the total doses of inhalers. I think we all know that institutional sizes of inhalers um, vary in size between, you know, some of them are seven dose, some of them are over 200, and you have inhalers costing two to $300 each, and you lose one that's completely full. I think we all know that's a huge loss. So, Published data has shown inhaler to nebulizer therapeutic interchanges may save money, reduce wasted doses, and improve multidisciplinary efficiency, while not negatively impacting COPD length of stay or 30-day readmission rates. I'll pass this back over to Trent. I wanted to just touch on the on the fact that these next step, these next steps we really talk about, a lot of this is going to stem on our experience. It's really to assist those calling in, trying to understand, you know, how do you approach this? I mean, these are some common questions. So I actually am totally open book. For years, I have been more than glad to get folks from other health systems to reach out and really just tap my brain about how we converted a giant health system across six states. Everything's hindsight, 2020, you know, I'd love to go back. I could do things a little bit different. Um, I think we've learned those things. So that question, I think, um, is very common. Um, I think the literature, you know, we still could use more. You know, honestly, there's, I didn't touch on it before, but, you know, there are still some other trials, you know, that are very focused, like labor trial that, you know, out of Wexner that looked at just doing, a, you know, um, it being converted over for like um, comm events. Com event, I love to pick on comm event because, Super pricey inhaler along with Atrovent. 
we have definitely improved literature on it. And I think that helps us um, look at, you know, some of the outcomes, the impact on R2 labor, I mean, how much of our costs, how the factory emissions, et cetera. We can always use more. And I hope more out there continue to publish um, because there are a lot of institutions out there that do this. Um, I think people are just unaware of how many. Um, and the next section, we're going to go through that. The biggest thing that I can recommend for you if you're going to sit down, I think this is going to depend on if, you know, you're a standalone small system versus large. Um, I'm going to be, you know, you really have to sit down and just look at, you know, what, what are your, your inhalers that you've got? You know, do you have restrictions on nubs? You know, where are they all being given? Um, really having a good feel on, you know, what each of your institutions do. Um, we all like to think that we're standardized to an extent. Um, but then we start digging into the dirt a little bit. We find out that maybe we're not so standardized. So I think that, um, you know, you really can, this is, this is an area that I think pharmacy is going to have to do. Um, this can certainly be started by the RT teams, you know, if you're interested in it. Um, I think pharmacy in general is always going to be, for the most part, interested in looking at this. Um, because there's no doubt that you're going to save drug costs and we all have the same pressure to reduce those drug budgets. Um, but really what you need to do is just go back and really just, whether it's you and you have access or you've got your corporate uh, procurement team or whoever it might be, um, you know, really looking at all of your inhalers, looking at the costs, who's using what, and really getting that, that, that um, baseline cost down. Um, and then I think also the spacers is worth looking at. Um, you can also look at nebulized tubing. Um, you're going to probably find that um, like in my system, for example, that was not standardized. I mean, yeah, we use mostly Misty Max, but um, we would go around the system and find that different ones actually had, you know, different um, high density nebulizers, you know. So, um, but we ended up, you know, with our big conversion, we did not consider the nebulizer tubing to be something we wanted to address. The RT departments wanted to keep that separate, and that was okay by us. Um, but I think that that should be considered. This is a big one. I think that you really should do up front. Um, you know, those of you that are doing formulary management on the floors, you know, your pulmonology leads, you know, your physicians are going to be the ones that are either going to be support or they're going to be the ones that are going to be the biggest um, burden to overcome to try to go down these roads. Is really, you know, get all of your stakeholders aligned, you know, and start systematically going through, you know, each one of them and figuring out who's in support and who's not. I think. You know, pharmacy leadership, you know, if, if pharmacy is running the show on this and trying to drive it, you know, we're the ones that are they're managing P&T. Um, we have to really look at, you know, what's what, what's on formulary. Do we need to do monographs? Do we need to add anything new? Um, do we need to look at working with pharma companies and looking at contracting and really decipher? Um, you know, the other thing that I always like to stand out, too, is um, I think it's important sometimes people forget to go back and ask your procurement teams, especially if you're a big system, if you've got. Um, specific um, contracts with some of the uh, pharma companies, umbrella contracts that might impact different buckets. Um, I think that's increasingly happening these days, and it's good to just make sure you got that assessment. Um, I do think you need to figure out if you've got the bandwidth, you know, depending on your Epic or CERN or something else, do you plan on, you know, creating power plans that are going to be specific, specific to it? Do you, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to do. I mean, from all the, the, the synonyms or med sentences that you have, you know, for the orbitals, from inhalers to nubs, you know, what kind of adjustments do you have to have? Um, are you going to build in automatic therapeutic interchanges? Those do require bandwidth by pharmacy informatics. I know our team is extraordinarily stretched most of the time. Um, and you do have to put that into the timelines. Um, you know, I do think that, you know, when you're like for us, we can do manual interchanges up front. Now we're all automatic interchange, it's all built in and it's very convenient, but I think that's important. I think they need, you need to have pharmacy informatics on your team as part of that, that stakeholder team. Um, of course, the providers, uh, you know, from, for yours truly, I, I had to be on the pulmonary system call and I had to really go, you know, talk to them about this issue. Um, you know, if we get rid of this, weigh the pros and cons, try to get those key stakeholders involved, uh, make sure that they're okay with it. Um, RT involvement, and I would also on the next screen, there's going to be RN involvement. I think it's really useful to go back and, you know, you really need to get a good handle on, on what are the RTs doing? Are they doing inhalers and nebs? Are they just doing nebs and the RNs are doing inhalers? Um, and I know in our system, 
Um, it depended on if it's critical access or not. We didn't have 24 seven RTs in those sites. You know, RNs took over all the nebs for 12 hours on the evening shift. Um, but I think it's very useful to make sure you get a good handle on if you're going to roll this out system wide, how it's going to individually impact each um, site. Um, you know, materials management, neb, neb tubing, different contracts they may have to do. It'd be the same difference as pulling in the procurement or contract team on the drugs. Uh, making sure that you're looking at all your drugs. Um, we certainly had to sign new contracts with um, NEB companies to try to um, sweeten the deal a little bit, you know, with the pricing, um, make sure it didn't impact other contracts. Um, it's worth looking at. We put consult hospital plant operations in here. Um, mainly that was based on my experience. So that was not something that I ever would have thought about doing. Um, when we started thinking about all the sites, you know, when you have inhalers and you're shipping inhalers all over your your hospital, I think unless you're, you know, even for someone like me that was actually in the place for over 25 years, I never actually um, had been in some sites, you know, and I think they really brought up that, well, do we have compressed air pipe tubing, you know, in all the walls? I mean, are there any spots that you might not be able to do those? Um, I think that that's a good exercise to do. I think um, that helps breed confidence in your process in terms of making sure that you can see, yes, we addressed all this. We know um, all the sites were allowing respiratory meds to be administered and that we can make sure we can support that change. Um, I think you'll find that you're probably going to be okay, but um, every site's different. Um, we put console finance down mainly because um, we did originally pull finance in because we had a larger initiative in my example of, um, you know, uh, we're looking at comic canister. I don't, you know, there's a lot of sites out there that have made comic canister work. Uh, we actually had two facilities and they were considering going that route. Um, we pulled finance in to help look at some different things. Um, I think if you're smaller institutions, your finance department might be involved in the contracting. I would argue in larger systems like mine, they're not really involved at all. So, but I think it's worth considering. Um, and the reason why I sort of make that statement, you know, about the common canister is it goes back to get your stakeholders in place. Um, that's a learning curve that we learned because, um, you know, we started going down this road and it seemed to me we put a lot of effort into this common canister evaluation for the system only to then later find out that um, pulmonologists had absolutely zero interest or support in it. And I think we wasted a lot of time on that before we eventually transitioned over to the NEB process, which was um, actually something we were talking about as well. Um, but I think that that's where it's really important to really talk to your stakeholders. Um, assess your current formula. I sort of touched on that on, the, on a couple of slides ago. Uh, go back and look at your formula. Look at every drug that you've got. Um, look at your NEB um, drugs on formulary. Um, I think like when we were doing this, we actually did not have our formoder or formoder on. We were using so many inhalers in the lava ICS space that we never had a purpose for that. So um, we eventually had to evaluate and put our formoder on, for example, and get that monograph, get it through PNT, get everything done informatically and from billable standpoint. So you'll have to do that. Um, and that really extends into that second bucket. I think it's quite common um, by my experience. I think you know, pharmacy has a tendency to want to nickel and dime everything uh, for good reason. I think we don't like waste. We're trying to control drug costs. Um, we all know drug costs goes up, um, you know, and there can be a tendency a little bit, I think, to do we really need long acting because they're more expensive. I mean, it's very attractive when you're looking at albuterol, epitropium or generic duonib. You know, they're, they're pennies on the dollar, you know, so you can convert those over, but I think that the problem with those is the short acting. It is going to require more nebulizations. And I think that's where long actings can come into the fray. Certainly for a lot of respiratory patients that do not have exacerbations, you definitely have a subset of them. It may have a significant subset of them to be giving them short actings the whole time. Um, asking RT is going there when you can do it once or twice daily. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I think that um, I would also say that I, for example, could not sell a short acting protocol. I mean, our, I think our physicians really like the idea of having all the drugs available um, that they had before in, in the sense of, you know, Gina and gold and, and having the ability to treat the different levels of disease states for patients. Um, I, I would agree. And the argument's correct that, you know, we don't really have published data, you know, on any of these long actings on a short acute care length of stay that is going to say you're going to get out quicker or it's going to prevent readmissions. I mean, I, 
that's something that's got to be tied back into your bigger initiative in terms of how you're approaching respiratory patients. But I do think that if you're going to go down this road, um, I can tell you firsthand that, um, you know, that's something that is much more helpful. This is just an example. Um, we're not going to, I think if you go out and ask um, different facilities, including mine, you know, I would be willing to share our protocol. You're going to see fairly similar, but I think this is essentially what you're looking at in terms of writing a protocol is really looking at, you know, if you've got short actings, you're going to convert them to short actings. If you've got long actings, what are you going to convert them to? Um, there are protocols, like I've said, where the llamas and labas all go to short actings and those, those institutions have made it work. Um, and I don't think they have a lot of interest in now adding long actings, um, because it will definitely increase drug costs. But I think that, um, you know, our protocol that shows those cost savings we have, have long actings. So, I mean, you can certainly go from, having a lot of inhalers to going to a more comprehensive protocol with long actings. And I think in the long run, you're going to save money. It's going to be a little bit easier to sell, but ultimately that's going to be your decision. You're going to have um, different contracting and really assess your personal finances, et cetera, and really talking it through with your providers to make sure you understand what they want. But um, that would be the general idea of how you would do this. Um, education is good. I mean, I think once you get to that point and you get things through, you know, P and T and you, You've written your protocol, providing you get to that spot. Um, you know, educating is super, super important, um, especially if it's system wide. I don't think this is news to anybody, um, but basically anybody and everybody that touches this process, you know, even the, even the folks with um, like case management, you know, like I said, you know, really sh talking to them about, hey, we're going to go down this road. We know that we've had. A lot of patients, for example, that are not pulling right with PFERS, I think we should be doing a better job pulling in DME companies, and these patients should be going home on inhalers that aren't working in the first place. Maybe we should do that. That's not necessarily a huge subset of patients, but I think that that um, is where you do need to get a lot of education in. Um, and I think that also you really have to uh, think about the go-live dates. Um, you know, is it going to be an all-for-one? Is it going to be a phased, phased approach? Um, as long as everyone's got, um, you know, the timelines in, in mind, you know, certainly buyers of pharmacy, I think one of the things that sometimes gets overlooked when you're doing a big change and um, when you're adding new drugs to, to formularies, when you're looking at your distribution networks, you know, um, like McKesson or Cardinal, um, if we're going to start going live with one facility, it might be a big deal. But um, if you go live and you got 13 facilities or more in a region and they're going to completely extract everything out that's in stock, um, you know, you certainly might have to go back and work, work with farm and the distributor, make sure there's appropriate stock, give appropriate lead times, um, deplete stock. If you can't send things back, let's say the inhalers, you know, a lot of the inhalers you can send back and get credit back, but it depends on the situation. So I think those are the, all the things that you need to think about, you know, before you do that, um, finally pull the trigger. Um, the program implementation. Um, Again, it's just you're going to have your specific dates. Um, you'll want to like go live with it. Um, again, I think that one of the things that I, I think by my experience when you talk to individuals is that it's a little bit overwhelming when you think about trying to go live on a big system. And I, and I think that my, my best advice is try to pull it back and quit making it so complicated. I think you can sit back and find a pilot site. Um, I've talked to more institutions, more systems that have actually got a couple or three hospitals already doing this. And they're actually then, you know, trying to look at the larger approach of how to roll it out system wide. Um, but I think that sometimes, you know, you're, you're going to have individual institutions that have RT managers, um, pharmacy physicians that are very, very pro on it. And there's just literally no pushback. Let them go let them prove what we've all proven already. Um, and then, you know, I use, I always make this, this joke that I think we all think we're, we're special um, and we're different individually. Um, and then usually, you know, but within a system, I think people may not believe, let's say what a banner does, but if your system lets a couple of hospitals go and you do this and it pulls off, okay, good feedback from the RT directors and the pharmacy, you can show that your readmissions aren't impacted. You can show that you're saving it's interesting, I think, within a system of how that helps roll it out to subsequent facilities. And despite ours, I mean, we had a five phase rollout because of that, because we had 28 hospitals. And I think that that actually helped us because every time we did another phase, we continued to get more support because we would have subsequent um, facilities with multiple people saying, you know what, it's, it's more doable than I thought. Um, and then that just gains traction.
And I think this is where I made a comment in the past. I think it would be, it, I would just encourage you know, anybody that does go down this road, we need more publications. I think especially on the RT labor front, um, I think Lexi will get more into that later. Um, that's always been a little bit challenging um, depending on, on just because of the RTs have so much going on um, and there's a lot of different variables that can impact their labor. So it depends on how you're measuring it. But I think that this is really valuable. It does take a lot of work. It takes someone with a concerted effort to want to go back. But I do think that, you know, um, a lot of times you may find that, okay, we'll, we'll allow this to go down, but you do need to go back. Can you eyeball the cost? Can you check to make sure our outcomes are okay? Um, and I think that that's worth doing because I think then as years go by, if someone comes back and asks, you'll have that data. And I think also it gives you an opportunity if the residents have studies, um, take it, you know, make poster presentations. It doesn't have to be a full publication, but I think that's really valuable for uh, both the pharmacy and the RT world to move that forward. Um, um, I do believe I was told that there were a couple more posters out there, you know, at ASHP this year that just finished up in Anaheim. Um, I think they usually don't have data ready, but um, I had lots and lots of posters that I actually utilized um, that remained unpublished, you know, when I rolled it out. And I found that those were super valuable because I think that they each individually helped sort of suggest the same thing that we found in our own right. Um, so I would encourage that. So I think what I'll do is I'll turn it back over to Lexi for the healthcare staffing. Okay, we're just going to talk about healthcare staffing now. Um, so I think we all know that there are major shortages of healthcare providers across the board. Um, with projections looking even worse through 2030, looking at respiratory less respiratory therapy, the shortages were identified far beyond the pandemic, but have now worsened. Um, burnout is one of the key drivers to this, in addition to expedited retirement. According to a 2021 AARC HR study, retirements for RTs are outpacing new graduates, with estimates of 92,000 RTs retiring by 2030. The U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics predicts a growth rate of 14% through 2031, so the number needed by 2030 is likely higher than previously reported. The COARC report in 2020, um, there was a 27% decrease in RT school enrollment, and only 10% of the RT schools are at full capacity. So recruitment of RT students is essential at this point. Of course, nursing is already having a shortage and continues um, to be having shortages of nurses. Um, in 2020, the HRSA nurse workforce projection reported a shortage of around 78,000 full-time RNs by 2025 and um, around 63,000 by 2030. A report from McKinsey in 2022 warned that the nursing shortage will reach 200 to 450,000 by 2025, which is around 20 to 10 to 20% of the workforce. To meet this demand, the U.S. would need to double the number of new RN graduates entering the workforce every year for the next three years straight. And this doesn't even take into consideration um, that's not likely to happen, but that's also assuming no one leaves. So. We've got a lot to do as far as planning for healthcare um, shortages in the future. Pharmacy technicians are also a profession which are in high demand. According to a 2023 survey in Pharmacy Times, turnover rates are 21 to 30 percent, and it's not unusual. Um, there are more than 88 percent of pharmacists say that finding technicians is their number one priority. A report by the AAMC estimates a shortage of physicians in all areas and will range from 54,000 to 139,000 by 2032. Merritt Hawkins, which is a uh, recruiting firm for physicians, reported that pulmonologists topped, topped their absolute need list as early as 2017 and the number of searches for pulmonologists and critical care specialists has grown by approximately 150% since 2012 and 13. This is of course attributed to the rise of COPD patients and the aging US population. Um, the takeaway here for this section is that um, 
multiple professional organizations um, are having issues with staffing their um, their professions. And over the next decade, it's going to be even more challenging, especially in specialized practices like pulmonology and respiratory care. Um, the growing number of elderly patients compounded by the projected number of patients with COPD may require um, progressive thinking with staffing and nationwide recruitment campaigns for healthcare professional schools. And lastly, efficiency practices may be necessary to allocate human resources appropriately while still providing high value-based care to patients. It's gonna talk about productivity, value-based care and protocols for a minute now. So as everyone knows, quantifying respiratory therapy productivity can be very challenging. Uh, many hospitals do it differently. Some, some um, have it built into their computer charting systems, some places based staff based on um, just the need for RTs to be there um, around the clock. It's, it varies across the country, but many departments use CPT codes as a proxy for productivity but a large number of high value procedures do not have a CPT code. Um, examples of these would be rapid responses, interhospital patient transports, spontaneous breathing trials, pulmonary disease navigation, and so on. Um, another thing to consider here is that most shift work for RTs is 12 and a half hours, but of those 12 and a half hours, um, only about 10 and a half hours are you're able to complete clinical and non-clinical activities. By the time you remove a 30 minute lunch, your pre and post shift reports, and then your two 15 minute breaks. So <clears throat> most hospitalized patients are admitted under a DRG payment system and a vast majority of these RT charges do not generate revenue. As you can see in the pie chart, there's a mixture of clinical activities, clinical support activities, and non-allocated activities. So uh, the clinical activities would, of course, be things like our BiPAP and vent patients, M MDIs, nebulizers, um, acapella, all of, all of our RT tasks. And then our clinical support activities are going to be things more along the lines of standing by for high-risk deliveries, um, transports, and those, those type of activities. The safe and effective staffing guidelines is recognized by the respiratory profession as the gold standard in benchmarking time standards for RT procedures. The time standards are developed by survey data from RT leaders and include a mix of variable and fixed activities which we mentioned in the last slide. RT leaders must advocate for safe staffing levels while balancing the variable activities. Um, the SESG includes value education and provided services as the driver to determine appropriate staffing levels, access to updated validated procedural time standards, scope of care and CPT codes, methodology to incorporate a value efficiency into staffing decisions, and respiratory um, and a toolkit to help leaders optimize staffing. A popular issue paper was written by Chat, Byrne, Ford, and Kaufman in 2019. The paper emphasized the need to incorporate value efficiency as a mechanism to define the number of caregivers to re required to deliver high value care. And they focused on three considerations. First of all, what value does respiratory care add to the healthcare organization? Are interventions provided necessary and of clinical value? And what is the value of respiratory therapists in the delivery of these methods? In other words, what procedures are RTs performing that are not adding value? Are these procedures improving readmission rates? Are they improving patient satisfaction? You can see other examples in table one on the slide above. And procedures like incentives barometry may have a CPT code and they can be counted as productivity, but there's not, there's not necessarily clinical evidence that is improving patient outcomes. So clinical practice guidelines or CPGs from the AARC are helpful to RT leaders in developing department protocols. One example of using an AARC CPG to reduce low evidence-based care is exemplified by the paper from Kellyanne Fleming, Jessica George, Sarah Basilak, and Julie Roski at Freighter Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. 
Recently, this paper won a prestigious award at the AARC Congress, the Mallinckrodt Literacy Award. Given the current and projected staffing crisis in respiratory care, they believed it was necessary to eliminate RT workloads and eliminate low value care, which would allow them to optimize and re reallocate these resources. Um, as you can see here, they, um, they were doing about, in May of 2021, they did a little over 9,000 NEB treatments in one month. That is over, that is around 300 NEB treatments per day. And by using the AARC CPG, Effectiveness of Pharmacologic Airway Clearance Therapies in Hospitalized Patients, the RTs were empowered to discontinue treatments that had no indication for treatment. And so by eliminating about 4,600 4, of those 9,000 um, non-evidence-based medications, specifically 3% hypertonic saline and acetylcysteine, they were able to um, reduce their workload and their total FTEs needed for this, and they were able to reallocate them for other value, more, more valuable care for um, our patients. In this slide, you can see the time standards um, for aerosol therapy. These are developed from survey data, which is collected from RTU leaders and then used to calculate means for therapy administration. What this doesn't necessarily take into um, consideration is we don't know how many meds are sometimes put in the cups. We don't know how large the, you know, medicines delivered are. We are not sure what brand or what style of nebulizers are used here, but you can see in this, the average survey, which it was 170 responders for acute care and long-term care. Um, we have small, small volume nebulizers, mean time 17 minutes, MBIs 12.7, and lastly, aerosol self-administration evaluation at 18.6. So there's definitely more need for time and um, time and motion studies talk about here in a second. This next study is a pilot study, um, and it is a study of time and motion to help quantify um, healthcare practitioner time. It was performed in 2018, but it's basically, um, it studied 40 total observations, 20 inpatient, 20 RN, um, RNs in the outpatient long-term care setting. But you can see the inpatient time is a little bit shorter. It also takes into consideration cognitive uh, patients versus non-cognitive. So there's a little bit of a difference there. Obviously it's gonna take longer for not cognitive patients to receive their medication. But interestingly, 50% of the process time was nebulization. This is just a little bit of a continuation of the prior slide and the prior study. Um, it just kind of gives an idea that using different kind of medications can actually um, give you more, um, you know, less visits to the patient, depending on if you're using long acting versus short acting. And then this, this is a very, you know, basic slide. It's just showing how uh, long acting medications have, you know, no peaks or troughs versus, you know, four times daily medication. So you can kind of see that, you know, the medicate how, how the medications work differently. And so, um, again, calculating RT productivity is challenging as many RTs provide resources that are not captured by CPT codes, but may remain valuable to the care of the patient. And we do have reporting manuals like the ESG, which are trying to help assist RT leaders in measuring that now. And value-based care initiatives have been shown to improve patient outcomes. And of course, um, for many years, respiratory therapy protocols have been implemented to help patients receive better care and eliminate unnecessary um, treatments. And then to summarize our presentation today, published data ind indicates inhaler and nebulizer therapeutic interchanges may save money, reduce wasted doses, and may improve multidisciplinary efficiency while not negatively impacting COPD length of stay or 30-day readmission rates. Efficiency practices may be necessary to allocate staffing resources as we face some major staff shortages in the future. And protocols are well supported in the medical community. Thank you so much, Lexi and Trent. That was a great overview. So we have time for a few questions. 
Uh, this one I'll kick to Trent. Um, could you please clarify how you've approached using an all NEB protocol in the time of COVID? Did you get pushback from nurses or other clinicians about the potential risk of COVID spread by using nebules? If yes, how did you approach this issue? Sure, I can take that. Um, yeah, I think um, that question, well, it's twofold. <clears throat> uh, we have to go back to uh, March 2020 when everything unfolded. And I think um, the world just really didn't know what to do. Um, we just didn't have enough information. You know, one of the things that came out, we actually had to design a COVID-19 inhaler protocol. Um, and we had to revise it about three times because um, the the literal amount of money we were spending on Comavent uh, is beyond anything I can even tell you. It was, we were spending more money um, with all the common events and the ways it's like we went back to a throwback. Um, the biggest problem that I think we struggled with was the pure lack of information, like good clinical information, um, not just, you know, just theory and conjecture that we're going to spread COVID to everyone. The biggest problem we had with that was we had this lack of PPE. Everyone remembers that. I mean, we couldn't even get some of that. And that was the biggest risk, you know, trying to assess you know, how many negative pressure rooms versus positive pressure rooms do we have? You know, can we get enough PPE, et cetera? We just really came to the conclusion we had to have an inhaler protocol. Um, we actually had that in place a couple of years. It's gone now. Um, it does not matter if you have COVID or otherwise at this juncture. Um, we're back to all NEB. Um, I think we've got quite a few meta-analysis and studies that have looked at this. And I think what they're doing the conclusions really do not support the fact that nebulization increases the risk of COVID more than inhalers. I think the notion that you can use inhalers and not catch COVID in the same room because if someone gets that and coughs and they spew it out, I mean, the healthcare provider is still at risk. I mean, you have to have universal precautions. Um, we actually have another health system in our region um, that actually went live, Alneb, from basically common canister um, during COVID and they are all know. And I think that, that system did the same thing. Um, they went back and really looked at what's available real real time. I mean, it took a couple of years. Um, I think now we just feel like we have enough PPE. You know, there's been suggestions, you know, some some sites are bringing band nubs, you know, because the band nubs are breath actuated, um, a little more control or over aerosolization, but all things being equal, our communication to staff is if you're with a COVID patient, you need to be using PPE and universal precautions. And if you do that, um, your risk should not be higher. Um, and that's where we stand right now. Um, I, I will maybe let you speak to it, Lauren. Um, I was just notified that there's a new um, chest article um, that just published in the last three weeks that addresses this whole thing, and I have not read it. So I think there could be some other information on there that you could be referred to. Thanks, Trent. That was a great answer. So I'll also add a, a link in the uh, chat. But there was, as Trent alluded to, there was a new article that was published in the Chess Journal uh, focusing on the guidance of mitigating the risk of transmitting respiratory infections during nebulization. So I'll add that in the chat as well. We probably have time for one more question and maybe Lexi and Trent can both weigh in on this, but what type of nebulizer do you use? We were using um, different kinds of nebulizers. In the beginning, we were using a basic jet nebulizer and attaching a filter um, to it. We were also using the band neb with a filter on it. Um, I think it just depends if we could you know, keep it contained in line on, say, BiPAP patients. Um, they were definitely trying to do that, or ventilator patients. Obviously, we're using aerogens, but I mean, every hospital has different resources, and so I think it just um, kind of just have to get um, get a little creative sometimes with ways to stay safe and keep staff safe. Yeah, I would say. Probably the same. I mean, I think beforehand we're always Misty Max, you know, I'm Misty uh, Max, and then we had, you know, mostly Misty Fast. It was being used on COPD patients. I think when COVID happened, um, I know many sites brought in, you know, band nebs and they were doing that. Um, and I and I know that they were using aerogens in the ICU. Thank you both. So we had one more question come in, and I think we have another minute or so. If you were to pilot test this strategy in a patient care area in one hospital, 
would emergency medicine or long-term care be best? Or where would you suggest that this pilot test be uh, operationalized? Um, I know, Erin. So thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, long-term care is interesting, um, mainly because the length of stays are so long. I think that I've always felt like there's a sweet spot with being on that. I think when you look at the hospital system, you know, I mean, the average length of stay, certainly with respiratory patients, are probably between the three and seven day mark nationally. Um, when you get into long term um, care, I think that you start getting really long length of stays. I don't personally know if I have complete grasp on where that break even is for them in terms of inhalers versus not. I mean, I will say that, like in our sites, though, um, nebulization is always a standard in the emergency room. I know my site was one of the top 10 busiest emergency rooms in the country. And if, if I'm reading that right, um, I think that uh, emergency medicine, if I've got you right, like an ED, um, you know, I, I would, if they're using a lot of inhalers in that site, I mean, I think that that's where you could definitely look at, you know, moving that over to nubs. I mean, that's our standard anyway. Um, uh, outside of, you know, we do have, I think, I, I don't know if I've mentioned, I mentioned in my, my paper that we do have an exception for like pediatric protocol, um, where we get 340B pricing and they try to discharge it out to prevent readmissions. I think it sort of depends on the population and what your current practice is. Lexi, any last minute thoughts to add? Um, just on that. I mean, we did, we did opt to keep. Uh, inhalers in the emergency room in some cases, if especially if they were going to be sh surely discharged with them. Um, if they came in very acute, acutely ill, they would be receiving nebulizers. But if it was something that they would be able to take a um, short acting bronchodilator and go home with it, that is one area that um, our pharmacists and physicians wanted to be able to keep inhalers. Um, Med surge was a good place for us to start um, and, and even ICU patients just um, to be able to um, implement this and get it going. Great. Thank you so much. If we didn't get to your question, I apologize. We're at time. But thank you so much for sharing an hour with us. And please don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Trent, or Lexi if you have any questions. Have a great day, everyone.